Welcome everybody to the webinar today. I'm Mark Graben. We're joined by Greg Jacobson. And so we're trying to do is this is titled Greg and Mark's Creative Continuous Improvement Webinar because we're trying to mix things up a little bit. I mean, this year we've done more panel discussions and other formats than the traditional presentation webinar. We're still going to do those, but we thought it would be fun to experiment a little bit. And we're going to share that agenda with everyone. But Greg, you know, I was, I was, you know, putting together the slides and I thought, well, gosh, this, this isn't very creative what I've put together here. This is our typical, usual welcome to the webinar slide. I don't know. Is that any, is, that's pretty ugly, right? I mean, that this feels like mid eighties to me. This <laughs> is like, this is how we grew up. So this is pretty creative. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I, I whoops, I, I know, so I, I made it Mark and Greg's. That's my ego getting in the way. So I apologize for that. <laughs> but welcome to our webinar. We're going to do some different things today. We're going to do um, a lot of audience participation. So I'm going to ask, um, we'll, we'll put this information back up again and it'll be on screen during these segments here. But um, we're going to use a platform called Menti. You can either open up a browser on your computer. This actually works really well if you want to um, you know, use whatever browser is on your phone. If you're into the QR code thing, that QR code they see on screen should take you um, to where you need to be to participate in the interactive portion. So go to menti.com. It's going to ask you to enter a seven digit code. You don't have to enter the spaces but enter, like it says here, 4731602. Um, we are gonna do a little mini three question quiz. Uh, it's gonna have a prize. So if, um, when you go into Menti, you can be um, a, an anonymous avatar. Um, if you wanna be eligible to win our little uh, our prize from a little three question quiz, uh, please do your, use your real name or at least your first name, last initial, and we can kind of confirm the winner from uh, from that. So here is the plan. Um, we're going to do using Menti. We're going to do a little bit of audience participation, get input from you, and learn a little bit about each other as an audience. And then we're going to do um, boy. When we do our weekly Kinexus team meeting, uh, Greg muses. So um, it's kind of his introductory monologue to the meeting, if you will, kind of like a talk show host or radio host. We're going to get some uh, some musings and, and then we're going to do our three question quiz. Um, Greg is going to talk for um, a couple of minutes, kind of like he might do at our annual Kinexicon event um, for Kinexus customers, just a little bit of the state of Kinexus. How is the company doing here in 2020? Um, we'll, we'll talk about future webinars and then we're going to spend some time in the mode of ask us anything. We've done 28 of those. Those are usually like a 30 minute video webinar. Um, this is sort of episode 29 in a way of the Ask Us Anything. A hey, quick and on court. It looks like some people in the comments want to see the Menti codes again. There's a link okay. in the comment. Yep. Menti uh, codes for everybody. Yeah, we'll put this uh, we'll put this back up. So and then we'll do some kind of fun closing questions at the end. Um, I don't hear. Maybe we'll, we'll we'll call a bit of an audible and let people get into Menti. Let me leave this up on screen. Greg, I'm going to put you on the spot. You, do you feel ready to muse? Oh, I can muse at any moment. I'm like a amusing master. It's funny that you you mentioned musing, and uh, Mark really uh, did 99.9% .9 of the, the planning for this, and he tossed us on, and I thought, oh, that's fun. So I started to muse, and it wasn't even a we didn't even call it musing. I just we kind of start off our, our weekly meeting and here are things I've been thinking about for the week. And then someone just said, oh, we got to hear Greg Muse. And so it just became part of what we did. And I want to muse about two topics. One, I want to do the muse that I did last Friday. And it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something and then it's going to be a tease for why you need to listen to the entire announcements. But by the end of this webinar and when you talk about the announcements, you will know what it means when I say letters to humans. And suffice it to say that I have become a very passionate, I'll use the word passionate instead of obsessed, but very passionate about learning as much as humanly possible related to the coronavirus, the pandemic, COVID-19. And I like to turn um, 
you know, obsessions into passions or negative things into positive things. And so my outlet for this has been to uh, really consume that and then, and then uh, talk to people about that and, and to write about it. Yeah. And uh, so it is in that vein that the, the muse from last Friday was stated, which is, it is the best of times, it is the worst of times. And so um, last week was a pretty profound week um, on both of those. One, I think everyone knows that the, the numbers in the U.S. are completely out of control. We could probably spend the entire um, hour talking about all the different reasons for that. Not going to do that. Everyone here knows the, the, the numbers. And um, everyone here knows that this is 100% a human behavior driven thing and that we all can um, uh, take part in being part of the solution. But let's talk about the best of times here, Mark. And there were two really fundamental things. And now a third that I can add that happened on Monday. But we had really great news on the interim analysis of Pfizer's uh, vaccine candidate, the mRNA vaccine candidate, where I think if you were following and reading about vaccine candidates, you would have been really happy with, well, one, anything above 50% would be eligible to be approved by the FDA. But anything really... Um, in the 60 to 70% range was everything that I heard uh, about from vaccine experts. And they reported a 90% efficacy. Mm -hmm. And so that efficacy is related to having symptomatic disease. They're not testing these people on a weekly basis to see if they have non-symptomatic disease or you know, tiny, mildly symptomatic disease. But 90% efficacy in preventing um, uh, symptomatic disease. And then on Monday, uh, Moderna came out with their mRNA um, data, and they reported a 94 and a half percent efficacy. So yeah. are, are they're essentially equivalent. They're, they're way higher than anyone anticipated. So again, this is interim analysis. It's science by press release. No one's seen the data, but it's a very hopeful that we will have a very effective vaccine sooner rather than later. But that's not all. There's one more thing that happened last week. And there was an EUA, uh, an emergency use authorization uh, that was provided by um, uh, provided obviously by the FDA for monoclonal antibodies. And monoclonal antibodies are basically um, in injecting a, a, a protein that acts like an antibody in your system. And it basically makes your body look like you've already seen the infection. So it boosts mm -hmm the time frame that your body normally needs two to three weeks to make these antibodies. And now with the monoclonal infusion, you can get the benefit of that. And that has a 75% reduction, 75 reduction in hospitalizations. So some of the uh, people, others might be wondering, how's that different than a vaccine? So um, a vaccine is introducing something in someone's body that generates that person's own immune response. Mm. You could give that to someone who's not sick monoclonal antibody could be used for someone that's not sick, but it's right now going to mostly be used for high risk individuals very early in the course of their illness. Cause we know that it takes about seven to 10 days for people to get um, sick to the point of needing hospitalization. But if we can almost abort that entire process, it's the, it's the, the drug that um, president Trump got mm -hmm. um, very early in the course of his illness that I'm sure contributed to, to him having a good outcome with COVID. And so, um, so that's, the, that's a little bit of how they change uh, the difference. But um, regardless, it's a huge, huge benefit if you are a high-risk individual that gets COVID. Uh, there's going to be obviously a lot of logistics um, that are going to have to occur to be able to, to do that. But I think those things are going to be ramping up. So best of times, it's the worst of times. That's my, that was my news on Friday. But I'd, lo I'd love if, if everyone's okay with maybe 90 more seconds on a news. I'd like to talk about trust. Okay. I'm timing. Of, I'm I trust you to keep it the 90 seconds. No. <laughs> uh, um, and and I'll, so then I'll, I'll really just frame the news as, as a question and as an observation, which is we, we talk about needing trust in, well, really any relationship. Business is no different. I've been thinking a lot about it with business. What I love is when things I learn from the business world apply in my personal world and vice versa. And, and, and trust is one of those things. But in order to, you know, to get trust from people, my challenge to you is to think about um, you being the first person to offer that trust. Mm. And that is really the role of leaders. The role of leaders is to extend trust to the people that they're working with, to take the first step 
in that. And uh, I think um, you will find that when you do that, you are reciprocated with trust back. And so just a little bit of thought on trust. trust. Great. I wasn't literally timing you, but I think that was. <laughs> I, I hope I did okay. I, I know I went a little bit longer on the um, best of times, worst of times. So. All, right. All right. Well, cool. Good job. So um, hopefully everyone can now see the Menti poll. And again, those instructions are on screen and they will remain on screen during um, the session here. So um, what country or US state are you from? This is gonna come up as a word cloud. Texas is in the house. Texas, Wisconsin, Canada. Oh, wow, we've got a Qatar. Ireland, Qatar. I think somebody typed other, all right. <laughs> Um, New Jersey, South Carolina. We, we often ask this in the chat while we're doing our sound check because we, we often have people attending from uh, multiple continents. We have a Georgia in the chat. Okay. Oh, please chat. Yeah, this is an informal webinar. We're going to, just because it's informal doesn't mean we're not going to talk about really juicy, valuable things, but please chat as much as you want yeah. and we will talk through them. All right. All right, so cool. So a little bit about where people are from. Go Texas. All right, so now you should on your phone or in your browser have a slider where you can either strongly disagree or all the way over to strongly agree. So if your organization uses the methodology or the label lean, you might say agree or strongly agree. This is not all encompassing, but we're just curious between Lean, Six Sigma, some combination of Lean, Six Sigma, daily Kaizen, which we're really passionate about at Kinexus, you know, engaging everybody in ongoing improvement, as opposed to a different form of Kaizen, Kaizen events or rapid improvement events. And then as a, a different management method strategy deployment or Hoshin Conry or Hoshin planning. I love what you, the, the framing of this question is in, what extent does your organization say or report, but it's just what extent do they use it? And so uh, I'll bet, I'll bet these numbers are, we have a little sampling bias because I think all the people on this, on this call are in some way interested in this topic and probably mm -hmm. want their organizations to do this more yeah. than, than they are. So well, and, and this is a different question than, you know, how effective is your organization with these different methods? But um, again, I'm not trying to make this like a competition. It was really more just trying to understand our audience that looks like lean or combined lean Six Sigma might be a little bit more predominant than um, Six Sigma alone. Um, daily Kaizen and events are kind of, uh, kind of about the same. And then, you know, strategy deployment, I found is often somewhat of an advanced method for organizations. Sometimes organizations start with strategy deployment, but sometimes that comes on uh, later. All right, well, cool. Thank you everyone for responding to that. We've got a couple more. This is a, a kind of a word cloud again here. What's the state of continuous improvement in your organization during COVID? So this is likely to be a lot more free form. I'm, I'm really honestly curious about the response here and, and what types of words and reactions and we get from folks. Too busy to improve, non-existent, it's unfortunate, struggling, stalled, essential, I'm almost afraid I asked. Okay, uh, strong, vital, improved, necessary, NA, vital, Furloughed, unfortunately. Gosh, fast and furious. It seems like there's 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 kind of a mix here. I don't know if that's a, yeah, sing yeah. a single bell curve or if that's a bimodal distribution at both ends of the, we've stopped or paused versus it's strong and ongoing and accelerating. This is really interesting to see. But I also see some words thriving, continuing mm -hmm. to mature. Helped us experiment, resilient thriving, supportive. So that's great to see. And we'll share in the, uh, the follow-up where it will share the snapshots of the, uh, the word clouds here. 
Very cool. Exceed. That's an interesting mix. Okay, thank you everyone for responding there. And then this is a question, you know, during COVID times, do you strongly agree or somewhere in between strongly disagree or strongly agree, agree? Our organization is now stronger due to CI work that's being done during this era. And it's interesting to look at that distribution, not just the average. At one point, the score was three because there was a, a one and a five response at the uh, kind of the different polls. So it looks yeah, like there's a little bit more of a distribution in the uh, the four somewhat agree, which is great to see. But I'm sorry, you, what were you going to say, Greg? Well, it's also the the wording. Our, our our organization is now stronger due to, or our organization, you know, would be stronger with more CI. I bet I'll bet if if it was phrased that way, it would have just been a five. Um, yeah, it's meant to be more of a yeah, what is as opposed or, to yeah, what could yeah. be. What could be exactly? But boy, okay, we ended up right dead in the middle with uh, three, but a little bit skewed toward. The positive, you know, I think, for example, um, um, UMass Memorial uh, Medical Center, UMass Memorial Health, you know, they, they've talked publicly. I interviewed their CEO, um, Dr. Eric Dixon, and, and, and they and some other organizations have said and reported this, that because of the investment that they made um, to continuous improvement activities during COVID, that they are performing better and that they are better uh, positioned and situated for the future. So I think that's really exciting. I'm also very excited. They have recently joined the Kinexus family. That is right. I wasn't sure. We're looking very much forward to working with them. Yes, I agree. Okay, so Greg already mused. So uh, we, we've, we've knocked that out. Um, um, we're gonna do a little three question quiz. And I am offering, uh, depending on where the winner um, is located and what your preference is, if you're located in the US, I'd be happy to mail a signed paperback copy of my book, Measures of Success, which includes a few examples of how we use these methodologies and what we've learned um, at Kinexus. If, uh, if you're international, it's easier and more cost effective. I can send you a Kindle version if uh, our winner ends up being um, international. And uh, this, you know, these are questions, some of them might be difficult, but maybe there's an opportunity to learn and, and let's see, this is gonna be like pub trivia. So you'll get points for having a correct answer. You'll also get more points for answering more quickly. And some of our Kinexus team members, well, I'll say you're not eligible for the prize. You might have an unfair. Oh, that's how I was gonna say, you don't want me participating then, Mark? <laughs> All right, question one. Okay, this is showing all the avatars of who is participating. <laughs> all right, so That's cool. we've got a countdown to start. In what year did Kinexus get its first paying customer? No, 2005, 2009, 2011, or 2015? Certainly not as long ago as 2005. You have to give those hints. I didn't do a great job of that. In pub trivia, they always uh, give you little cheesy hints to make it easier as time goes on. So uh, the correct answer, and again, this may be guessing, but we're gonna learn something. Um, Greg, let me turn it to you and, and talk a little bit about, it's almost, it'll be 10 years. Um, yeah, well, you, you picked actually all milestones in Kinexus. 2005 is when, when I had the idea of uh, Kinexus, and it, it, or really, it wasn't Kinexus then, it was just the idea of using technology to develop, facilitate Kaizen work in the emergency department that I was working with. 2009 is when we formally started the company, and 2011 was when we had our first paying customer. We barely got in, it was right at the end. Mm -hmm. And then 2015, and really 2014 is is the year that we we raised the, the much bigger round in, in many ways, went from just being three people kind of hacking away at something in a garage to being bigger hacking away at something in a garage. <laughs> yeah. And at one point for Greg, there was quite literally an office in the garage. Yep. Stereotypical uh, startup tale, right? Yep. Okay. So that's question one. We got two more questions and then we're going to get Greg's state of Kinexus and then we're going to do ask us anything. Um, question two. 
Greg is what kind of physician? Yeah. And this is not good, <laughs> bad, strongly agree either. He just plays one on TV, emergency medicine, veterinarian, oncologist, or internal medicine specialist. I wonder how many people are going to Emergent answer coming up. All right. So I think a lot of people know that about Greg's background. Um, what, what else do you want to say? And I, and I, I made sure your, your title and your video says Greg Jacobson, MD, he's still a physician, still working, right? I he sure did. I, I, yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say about emergency medicine is that I think e ER doctors in general are a little bit more risk takers than non risk takers and starting a startup is a very risky endeavor. It also is one of the, the, the specialties that allows you to scale how many shifts you do. So I have uh, the privilege and honor of continuing to do two shifts a month at a local ER and I really enjoy being a physician, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there, it's funny, a lot of people said internal medicine. I found um, like a lot of the big names in the lean healthcare movement happen to be internal medicine specialists. Um, John Toussaint, uh, our friend from uh, Wisconsin and Catalysis, who was previously a hospital CEO. Um, Dr. Gary Kaplan, CEO of Virginia Mason, um, internal medicine. Um, some other um, really, really solid and well-known lean healthcare leaders are internal medicine. What they'll say, I'm curious what you think, Greg, is that internal medicine specialists are, are in, in particular taught to think systemically mm. about the body and maybe that serves them to thinking systemically about organizations. Um, I hadn't thought about it. The first thing that comes to mind is it's a numbers game. There's a whole bunch of internal medicine <laughs> doctors. <laughs> that could be too. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So we'll have question three here before we figure out who um, our winner is. Question three. The first Kinex's customer was in what industry? Going back to 2000. I did oh. not realize these three questions were all going to be fun Kinex's trivia questions. This is fun, Mark. Software, government, mining, healthcare, manufacturing. You might not, might figure because Greg is a doctor. Yes, I think a lot of people know. Um, and our, our first for a while, our first customers were in healthcare, but we we do have customers in manufacturing and mining and government and all kinds of different sectors now. Yeah, 2013 was the the year that we branched out because. Over half of the people that reached out to us, Mark, if you remember, were non-healthcare people that said, why are you talking only about healthcare? Right. These right. are manufacturing and automotive principles. And, and y'all are thinking and talking and solving this problem in a unique way that no one else is. And we want to use it for our, for our industry. And yeah. so it really didn't take long. It took us about a, a month worth of development work to become industry agnostic mm -hmm. in the platform. So um, about... 60% of our customers are non-healthcare and about 40% are healthcare now. Yeah. So that's... And we, we, we um, you know, it's interesting to look back. I mean, our website at the time was completely geared toward healthcare, the messaging yeah. and elements of the software, you know, where we talk about uh, patient safety, well, that can be generalized into um, different metrics or categories of improvement and, um, yeah, I remember getting one of those emails. Why won't you sell to us? I'm like, okay, well, that's a good situation to be in. But like, you know, a lot of startups, I mean, you start somewhere, right? You start in one vertical, you get a beachhead somewhere and you move on. So that's not unusual for um, a startup to focus in one vertical. One move. of the early taglines, Mark, I don't even know if you know this or remember this was helping healthcare heal. Well, I think that was before my time. I remember yeah, was, we, we talked about making improvement easier. Making improvement easier, yeah. Make improvement was, happen. Yep. Of spread course, now continuous it's spread and, continuous improvement, yeah. and it, it is beyond a tagline. It is our mission statement um, 100%. So. Yes, it is a, a purpose, a reason for being. Yes. yes. All right. So let's go to the leaderboard. Ba -ba -ba. Frosty. Oh. <laughs> All right, so Sam G is our winner. So Sam, I'm going to ask you, um, send, shoot me an email, mark at markraven.com, and we'll figure out what to do with the prize. So it looks like Sam got all three questions right, and uh, 
did so relatively quickly. So congratulations, Sam, way to go. <laughs> I, 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 there should be a special prize for fifth place. Someone <laughs> I like that. Yeah, we'll figure something out. All right, so um, with that, let me just jump back over to, here, I'm gonna just stop screen share for a second. Um, thank you to everyone for participating there. And um, this will be, I guess, a muse on a different topic. Uh, we asked Greg to share a little bit on just the state of the business before we get into the continuous improvement questions. Yeah, no, that's great. I uh, I don't have anything necessarily prepared um, for this, but Mark did tell me to be ready to talk about this. And I think I think probably the most important thing uh, that that I share with everybody is that we are very fortunate at Kinexus. Um, it, certainly the economic downturn has hurt us, but um, we have weathered the storm really well. We we froze hiring in, in March um, out of abundance of per, uh, precaution and really not knowing where we were going. And it became really obvious by August that um, we were going to be able to make it through the downturn and um, not have any major issues. Um, and so we opened, we opened hiring back up and we've added, I want to say three people to the team and uh -huh. we are about to hopefully add a fourth and we'll be, we anticipate probably um, expanding our team almost by 50% next year. And so we are in a, a, a big growth mode. We're, we're really focusing on tightening up a lot of our processes because of that. Because when you're a 10-person a team, everyone just kind of knows the way things are done. And then once we hit about 20 people, we started to realize that we needed to start employing some of the disciplines and some of the practices that people come to us to help them organize. And now we realize uh, as we kind of venture into the 30, 40-person team, that um, having all of those things really tight is going to be super important. Um, I will give you a quick mental image um, <laughs> that um, I think is kind of funny, but it relates to it relates to furloughs. And one of the things that um, the leadership team we tripled down um, on in Kinexus was being very transparent about our financial status. A lot of startups were struggling. Many companies didn't make it. And um, so we, we almost weekly talked about kind of the status of, of where we were at and had made a commitment that um, no one was going to get thrown off of the, uh, the proverbial boat, uh, the Kinexus boat. And uh, Jeff Roussel, our chief revenue officer, said, we will all cut our left arm off before that happens. And so you can just kind of envisioning us all like. Anyway. Greg, um, Greg, Greg could stitch us up if that happens. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll just take that arm off and put it back on later when we, the boat's stronger. But um, we, we were very adamant about that. And uh, um, I think over communicating was a really important thing. And so we're really excited um, about kind of where we're at from um, a strength from Kinexus' side of things. And we're having a ton of fun. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. And there was a question that came in from, um, via the chat. Yes, all of our employees um, are in the US. Yep. And how many, we're, we're at about 25 to 30 people. If you, if you add in, we, we have a, a number of people that, that are not full FTE. So we're probably at a little over 30. Once you include those people like videographer and content writers and some other um, people, but, um, and right now I believe everyone is in the U S. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's true. All right, so before, and we had a lot of questions submitted in advance for the Ask Us Anything. Um, you, you can submit questions via the Q&A, and if, if we don't get to them, we'll, we'll hold um, those questions for future Ask Us Anythings. We might go back to that kind of standalone 30-minute Ask Us Anything format after um, the end of the year. But before we go into the Ask Us Anything mode, um, we're gonna do a few announcements. So um, first off, we've got upcoming webinars. If you are a Kinexus customer, the next training team office hours, I believe it's gonna be with Adam and Matt. It's gonna be December 3rd. You can register for that at kinexus.com slash webinars. Um, again, if you are a Kinexus customer. And then open to everybody. Um, really interested, um, I think it's really interesting to see uh, an experiment play out here um, December 8th. 
So um, one of our webinar presenters earlier this year, Simon DeCastro, um, presented in um, English, which is um, you know, not his um, original language. And he did a great job with that presentation. And Simon, if you're watching again, thank you for that. And thank you for your suggestion. Simon actually said, well, it would be interesting. Why not do a Spanish language webinar? And so um, we were introduced to, and we, we met Albanesa Yamaya. Uh, she lives in the Dominican Republic and she has a lean um, consulting group. Um, so she's gonna be doing a, a presentation in English, it's titled, so it's funny, we've got Japanese words. Um, kaikaku first, Kaizen event later. So uh -huh. one translation of the word kaikaku from Japanese is more like radical change, radical improvement, a big step function improvement. Kaizen events may be a smaller, slightly more incremental improvement of the process. So I'm not gonna try saying it in Spanish. You can see the title here. So um, Albanesa will be presenting live in Spanish on December 8th. Our colleague JJ Puentes is going to uh, play host and moderator for that in Spanish. Um, but um, Albanesa will be recording uh, a version in English. So if you go and register for that, we'll send you the English recording um, in advance of December 8th. That's currently um, the plan. And um, again, the live presentation will be done by Albanesa in Spanish. And then Greg mentioned earlier, um, this is kind of a side project website of his that's, uh, well, it's just Greg, I'll just let you tell the story. Yeah, so I, I think I alluded to this, but starting on March 13th, I started to write letters to people. The initial letter that I wrote was to all the Kinexians explaining about what was about to happen. And then on March 15th, I was talking to a really close friend and uh, he was mentioning what he was gonna do that day. And it, it, it occurred to me that he just had no concept of, of what was about to happen. and. I, in talking with more and more people, I realized a lot of people didn't realize what was about to happen. I have the um, fortune of uh, living with my wife, who is also an ER doctor. And so we immediately, we had seen the writing on the wall even predating that. And um, she had sent out a letter to our immediate family in, in late February, describing what we thought was about to go down. And that led me to start writing. Initially, it was daily, Mark, you might remember, but in March, all the way through April, I, I wrote a, a daily letter yeah. to um, people. Initially, it was all family and friends, and then it just people kept getting added and added, and then eventually Gmail shut me down and said I'm sending too many emails, so it flipped over into ultimately this, which I, I call Letters to Humans, and it's because every um, entry starts with, uh, it's a letter format. So it's two humans and, uh, um, they now come out on Thursdays and I would love for everyone here to go to letters to humans.com, click on the subscribe button. I will never market to you. This is not in any way, uh, a, a mechanism for me to make any money. I have no agenda other than to communicate meaningful, scientific information regarding the pandemic and COVID-19. And uh, I do not talk politics in here. And so it's it's really, I, I, those are the only things I, I kind of have been passionate about uh, making sure that I stick to. And uh, people have continually keep giving me feedback. They, they thank me for, for putting it together, for explaining, for example, what a monoclonal antibody is or um, the, the vaccine candidate or um, Marcus over the no last number of months uh, fed me um, interesting articles that he's read. One of the ones I remember is he sent me about the, the UVC far light, which I don't know if he even remembers sending it to me, yeah. but he sent it to me like in July. And um, I eventually, I think by September or something, put something together, but um, on it. So please Go sign up, um, forward it to your friends and family, uh, trying to get uh, good information out there. And now I'm tweeting once a day because I had too many links back in my back queue. And I'm going to experiment, I think, with Instagram uh, coming up. And so 
That is Letters to Humans. Please, please, please um, subscribe. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, other resources, we want to remind you of our continuous improvement webinars on demand library. Um, tons of content. It's all free. Um, you can find that at kinexus.com slash webinars. Uh, we've got our blog. Um, we've got our podcast. So the audio for this session, um, I think, yeah, I may edit it a little bit, but um, well, well, we'll put that in the podcast feed as well. This was a customer suggestion years ago to take the webinar audio and republish it um, as an audio podcast. So you can find us um, in all the usual places. And it's, and the then, way I keep, it's the way I keep up with all of our webinars, Mark. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's in my feed. And so yeah. I never miss Download and listen to them whenever you like. And then um, Greg is actually going to be a guest real soon. I mean, he's, we've already recorded it, but I'm going to be releasing an episode of uh, kind of my most recent project, uh, a podcast called My Favorite Mistake. Greg's an overachiever, so he talks about like five different types of mistakes. <laughs> so my favorite mistakes with Greg I Jacobs. Could, I, I could do 10 if you needed, Mark. Yeah, well, maybe we'll do another episode, but <laughs> we learn from making mistakes and, and that's a great lesson, I think. So I encourage people maybe um, to go check that out. And if you go subscribe, you'll get the episode with Greg coming up real soon. Okay, so let's go into uh, question, question time. Um, Jason asks, we're trying to start a continuous improvement culture. We're having problems getting the staff to buy in. How do you recommend starting a continuous improvement culture? So like to me, I think there's two parts of this. Maybe I'll just tackle some of this first. You know, if we, this type of thing would be great to have a conversation about Jason and maybe we can follow up and do this um, privately sometime. So like what, what sim, like what, you know, we step back and ask why. Why are people hesitant to participate? Um, there could be different fears. It could be, you know, maybe a matter of communication. Um, you know, in, in, in my experience, you know, people are really hungry to have their voices heard and to participate in improvement, but there may be historical remnants of, let's say a previous suggestion box system that didn't work well or, or fear that speaking up with ideas may bring um, you know, negative attention instead of positive attention. But, but Greg, Greg, what do you think either about you know, like just that, I guess just back to that general question of what are some ways to get started with continuous improvement? I answer this question differently. 15 years into my journey than I would have at the beginning. Oh, at the beginning, I would have said, well, just start. And uh, now I, I think I realized the, the role of leaders. And, uh, and when I say leaders, I don't necessarily mean only the, the C-suite of an organization. I also, I also mean even local leaders. But um, in, in our experience, cultures that that are successful, that are sustainable, that are spreading, are driven by, by leaders at organizations. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely vital that they not only uh, champion the process from being the, um, the cheerleader, if you will, that they not only do that once, but they do that really every time they're communicating, whether it's in an email communication, whether it's in a town hall, whether it's in the weekly standup. Um, but that then, that then they then translate that into doing improvement themselves. And so whether that's a leader participating in a gimbal walk or having leader standard work or simply doing it informally by asking people, hey, what, what improvement have you participated in recently? Not in an accusatory way, but in an inquisitive way. Um, are, are, um, as long as that's done in a, in a disciplined way, are, are all, I think, really key. And again, that doesn't need to be at the C level of an organization. Um, if you are in a local department or a local team, the, the leader of that, that team can also do this type of work. If you're not one of those people, people I, I would, I think my efforts would be in engaging a leader and getting his or her buy-in because it will make the process much simpler for you to be successful in it. I mean, I think one other thing that comes to mind about getting started, I mean, sometimes the barrier 
what may look like a lack of buy-in is people being, um, you know, putting too much pressure on themselves and they're trying to come up with big, huge million dollar ideas. And, and those, uh, those might be few and far between. People may put too much pressure on themselves and that may stifle creativity. So I think the advice of um, starting small or almost even like if people really seem stuck, make a game of it almost and say, well, what do you think? What's the smallest improvement that you could come up with just to get the wheels turning and then people can move up uh, to, to larger improvements from there. And I think also you're, you're trying to identify, are you recognizing or emphasizing a bottom up type of improvement culture system, a top down? Are you focusing on strategy and then figuring out uh, one, I, I would not recommend starting all of those all at once. Uh, that, that's, you can read, you can read James Clear. So what did it take me? 41 minutes before I mentioned James Clear book, uh, mm -hmm. Atomic Habits. But if you, if you read his, his book, and really what we're all talking about here, are how do we develop a, a, an organizational habit of thinking about improvement in a disciplined and repetitive way? And um, I think if you, if you look at um, habit science, it would say not to start off with you know, biting off everything or trying to boil the ocean, but, but starting off with something small, something that's uh, achievable. And so let's just use bottom up improvement as, as the, the idea. So now you've got the leader buy-in. Yes, the, the leader of the, the team or the location of the department or the whole organization is interested in doing this. And the, the way that we found uh, really successful in places that I've worked at and with our customers is simply asking, well, hey, what bugs you or what's bothering you or what would make your life easier if we, if we tackled that? And then, of course, coaching them to the low cost, low risk, 10 feet around you area. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a other other tidbits to take away. Yeah. And I'm going to put um, in, in the chat. Um, I really like there's two books written by a psychologist, Robert Moore. Um, the more recent book is called The Spirit of Kaizen. And that book is actually sold by Toyota at their visitor center in Japan, which I think is interesting that they choose um, to sell that book. I think that's a great endorsement. Um, he has an older book. I think it's called, oh gosh, what's like one step at a time. Or um, if you, if you search more um, on Amazon, you can find it um, having a brain cramp, but, but his books are great. And it gets into some of the psychology of getting started and instead of trying to develop a perfect system, for example. Um, we had another question, I think as a follow-up, Greg, Alex asked, um, you talked about using CI initiatives internally and Alex was curious to hear more about the team's journey. In other words, your startup talk, um, how are you eating your own dog food? So, yeah, that's a, uh, there's a lot to that. I, I think I would probably say that we, um, we have a system for bottom-up improvement. Um, and we just literally call them improvements. There, there are not many fields for that form. We either kind of look at those in, in real time or ad hoc. We also have put a weekly meeting on the calendar with all the leaders of all the divisions to make sure that things aren't slipping through the cracks. And uh, we that's probably our kind of bottom up improvement. We've, we've been doing that for, for years in Kinexus. We've, um, as we've added more and more project management functionality, I know that if people are looking at our system now, you would not have imagined time that we didn't help manage projects. But if you look back at you know, almost eight, 10 years ago, it was really just focused on bottom up. But, but now we have, so we have a separate template for our projects. I, I feel like we've done a, a, a poorer job on that side of things at Kinexus. And so we've done a little bit of project work kind of in Kinexus back in 2016, maybe 2017, as the functionality in the Kinexus has become more robust. And as we've gone from an eight, 10 person team into a you know, 20, 25, 30 person team, we realized we needed a little bit more rigor on that. So the last couple of years, we, we asked people to be involved in, in a project or two. And we tried to drive that. And, um, and now we're realizing as we're getting bigger, we need even some more um, rigor around that. So one of the things I learned this year 
is that trying to have a person, a single person do what I, I call them strategic projects. You know, these are areas of work that are bigger in scope than a small improvement that is not part of your everyday work. That's kind of my little definition of it, is making sure there's at least two people on that team. We found that the projects that had more than one person, people are more energized. And the people that had one person, um, less happened until I kind of got involved. Hey, Mark, what are you doing with this? Let's put something on the calendar and work through it. And then all of a sudden things happen. So that was a, a big thing for us to learn. And uh, now we're, we're really excited that a member of our team is going to be moving into um, helping out with these projects full time, not to do them all, but to help uh, organize, to make sure they're all interrelated, to make sure everyone knows which ones are people working on, to make sure we're not tackling too many. And so it's been an interesting evolution. And, um, and then we do, uh, we put all of our data in Kinexus. So every division has a different board that they report on um, data. We try not to make it more than six or seven um, uh, data points that we have people look at. Um, we use Kinexus also in a whole bunch of um, uh, non-traditional ways. <laughs> Um, just because we we know kind of the power of it. And so we manage all of our customers in Kinexus. We manage all of our bug reporting in Kinexus. And we do a whole bunch of other weird things. But right. and, by, the, and by, by divisions, you mean like marketing, development, customer experience? Yep. Um, product and dev and, and sales. I think yep. those are... Um, since the, we, you know, we, we call this ask us anything, Craig asks, why are you boarded into your room? <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly enough, this is part of the garage. Um, I assume you're referring to the, about the boards, right? Yeah. So, um, this is part of the garage. That was an unfinished area that after we moved out of my closet, which is what Jeff affectionately refers to, because it was this tiny little room off of our bedroom that I worked in there with you. Yeah. yeah, could have literally been a closet. Um, we moved here and we finished it out. And um, I guess I'm not very good at floating and taping. And so we used furniture grade <laughs> plywood for finished. Well, yeah. it, it looks cool. We, we took down some of the, the pictures that are usually up there because we were doing some. I don't think I even showed you, Mark, but we put a bathroom back there. It's pretty oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to flip over to Menti because we had a couple other just fun oh. questions for the audience uh, okay. along the lines of ask us anything. Um, what's a good movie that you've seen recently? I, I saw American Factory um, a while ago, maybe a year ago when that first came out. Whoops. Let me bring that up. That clearly wasn't error proof to my part. Uh, 13th, the documentary, I've seen that. Chef's Table Barbecue. I think that um, maybe includes uh, Aaron Franklin from Austin, kind of our barbecue hero down there. So, okay, well, and we'll let maybe more recommendations come in as uh, as we chat here. Um, Greg, well, are, you here's gonna, a, are you gonna send these out, Mark? This, this would be yeah, fun. yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll get screenshots of um, all of these responses. Um, so here's a, a question uh, from Chris, uh, what, process improvement do you think we should have been doing all along, but the pandemic helped push into the mainstream? So that's maybe, that, 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 could, be, that could be answered a lot of different ways. Like for one, I'm gonna, I'll just say something real quick along the lines of healthcare. I've talked to a number of health systems who've said basically what had been a three-year or a five-year roadmap for telemedicine, meaning like video visits and all of that was accelerated and implemented in two or three weeks. So it kind of goes to show like there's, there's nice to have someday projects and then when the motivation is right, sometimes things can, can happen very, very quickly. And, and I bet a lot of that will remain post pandemic. In a lot of ways, that's probably just a good process improvement for healthcare. I think it's an interesting question. I hadn't given a thought, but the first thing that comes to mind, Mark, is it feels in the pandemic that you really have to embrace um, perfect as the enemy of good. And uh, in, in many ways, we're just doing things that are kind of good, good enough, like it, it provides value and you move on because of the constraints 
And then there's this kind of this realization that, wow, had we had had that philosophy even before we would have had net way more improvement all along because mm-hmm. just because you're implementing something now that's good doesn't mean you're you're stopping at that point. You're always going to revisit it, hopefully. And so it, it, it feels it feels like we've um, allowed that to happen a lot more um, to the benefit mm-hmm. of, of society and whatever system we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I think one other system or even more along the lines of personal process improvement, like I was just trying to think, like even as we get into 2021 and hopefully we get the pandemic behind us, there might still be compelling reasons to wear a mask on an airplane. You know, in in Asia, it's quite common for people to wear masks. Um, Quite often it's um, like in Japan, it said people wear masks to avoid spreading germs to others. And so even if it comes down to the common cold or, or flu, I wonder if masks will become at least uh, for, for more accepted. There are some, some people who will be happy to get rid of the mask, but I might keep wearing a mask on a plane. What do you it's think? Cer- it's certainly, I mean, I haven't been on a plane in the pandemic, but it would be really nice to be able to fly and then not feel sick for a couple of days afterwards, which. Which happened before feels, the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, if that happens 50% of the time or 25% of the time, it sure would be nice to make that 1% or 2% of the time. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, being a physician and doing procedures, masks, I've never felt, um, you know, that foreign to me, right. but I would have felt probably pretty awkward wearing a mask in a non-medical place. And now I don't think I, I don't, I don't think twice about it. It's just like, you just do it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's take a look. Uh, thank you, Chris, for that question. Um, question from Kathy. How do you map process flows when you don't have a physical whiteboard, sticky notes, or flip chart? So I, w- I would start to answer that by bringing up um, some of the virtual whiteboard tools. But Kathy adds, here's the kicker. I find the virtual whiteboards to be hard to use for quick mapping. Um, so, I mean, one thought that comes to mind, I mean, I, I, I'm a huge fan of... Um, the different Google Docs, um, Google Docs, Google Sheets, you know, the equivalents of Word and Excel in Google land because it's very, very, uh, it's good for real-time interaction of multiple people, you know, kind of working on a document literally simultaneously. Like I, earlier in the pandemic, I did some work um, just using Google Slides, which is the Google version of PowerPoint. Um, to, to do some collaborative mapping. But, you know, I would think, you know, even if drawing shapes or things like that are getting in the way, maybe even the first pass is just literally using a, a plain document and just bullet pointing out some of the different steps in the process. And then maybe somebody comes back and draws a draft of that. So that's one thought that comes to mind for me. I don't know, Greg, have you done any virtual mapping or I don't know, um, something that you've done? I, I haven't, but I, I will just say that we're doing, we're starting the process of doing some serious deep thinking on, on, on this topic. I'll just leave it at that. And yeah. I also, there was a, a quick comment. Have you ever thought about using your system for an accreditation purposes? We absolutely, we have the ability to um, track that and in Kinexus and people have used it to, uh, if they're doing a, class or a certification, let's say on A3s and then doing that, that A3 in Kinexus. So mm-hmm. that is a, a, uh, not an uncommon use case for Kinexus. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to throw things back over to Menti. Oh. Um, getting more back into the shop talk, uh, a good continuous improvement book that you've read recently. I'm going to grab, and I'm still partway through it because there's a lot there. I'm going to give a plug for my friend Katie Anderson's book, Leading to Lead, Leading to Learn. Um, it was written kind of with and about a Toyota leader, Asao Yoshino. And um, I was actually going back through, you know, photos, Facebook and Apple Photos reminded me it was eight years ago this week when I went to Japan for the first time and actually had a chance to... Um, hear a lecture from Mr. Yoshino and had a chance to have dinner uh, with him and, and, and a group. 
So it's fun reading about that in uh, the great book that Katie's done. I've got people recommend uh, The Gold Mine, Michael Ballet, um, Sprint, Lean Thinking, Creating a Lean Culture by David Mann, Cracking the Sales Management Code, uh, Lean IT, Achieving Transformation Through Lean and Innovation. So good, maybe we'll just, we'll leave that up and um, see if there are other thoughts and contributions around that. Um, another question for related to CI, Felipe asks, um, what in your opinion is the best way to recognize team members' contributions to improvement? I'll take a stab. I mean, I think it's, it's literally to recognize team members contribution. I, I feel I, we have we have gotten into the habit at Kinex on those weekly meetings to give shout outs. And shout outs are pretty powerful. Um, making people feel appreciated is amazing. And it, it's not common that people uh, give me shout outs because I think the idea is to, you know, give it to other people on the team. But um, recently someone gave me a shout out and I was like, ah, that felt great. And I was just reminded of um, it's great when you're appreciated. I um, was recently one of the, the nurses I work with, the nurse manager was like, oh, did you realize you had a good Google review online? I'm like, no, I had no idea. And she's like, oh yeah, we put it up on the board. Here it is. And so I was just like, just feel like a million dollars. Um, so I, none of those exchanged any kind of certificate or gold stars or, or rewards or money. Um, and uh, they were just simply being recognized. But I think appreciation needs to be in front of people also. Like, I think it's it's one thing to, to pull you off to the side mark and say, hey, I really appreciate this work you did. Um, that takes it to another level when, when you do that in front of a team. And hey, Mark, I really appreciate this work you did. So I, I, I'm a fan of doing that. Um, in, I've seen it in at least one setting though. So my, my caveat, I agree, generally speaking, most people like being recognized publicly. There are some folks though, who really hate that. that yeah. 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 I, I think that's true. I, I know, I know at least one person on the team that has told me, um, and I'll, I'll use a, a, a gender neutral pronoun that they hate it. Um, so I think it's a really good point. Um, but I, I think, you know, one other soapbox I, I get onto, we've got a couple of minutes left here. Um, people talk about rewards and recognition, and I think there's often too much emphasis on rewards. Mm -hmm. We think about recognition and maybe rewards. I mean, I think, you know, tapping into people's intrinsic motivation to make their work less frustrating, more interesting, more fulfilling, to provide better service to customers, you know, I, th I think that's really important to tap into and recognition um, doesn't have to cost anything other than time. And I think if we've got a good culture, we don't have to um, force improvement, um, whether that's by setting targets or quotas or minimums, that gets dysfunctional. Um, offering cash incentives can likewise get dysfunctional. So I, I like to sort of try to challenge leaders to, to think about how can we tap into people's intrinsic motivation? How can we strengthen that in, in and, different and, ways? And I would recommend if, if what Mark just said doesn't resonate with you or you're like me and you wanna see the science behind that statement, then Daniel Pink's book, Drive, is a good survey of that information where he kind of goes into the science and the social science behind intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And so before you kind of come up with a program or a, a, a behavior of what you do at your organization, it's, it's definitely worth a read. Yeah, maybe kind of final follow-up as we're up here. Good follow-up question from Chris. How do you balance the need for recognition without making it contrived? There may be a point of diminishing returns. So yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the art of leadership to look for feedback loops from your team. How are they responding to the recognition? Is, is, is the way they're responding changing? And if so, you know, can you kind of lean in and try to understand what's causing that reaction? Do you need to adjust your approach? So, I mean, I think it's hard to say one size fits all and one size yeah. might fit, might not fit over time. 
I mean, I think probably the one size that fits all would be being authentic. Um, I think if something doesn't feel authentic, people can spot that out. So, yeah. yeah. And the final question, um, we, won't, we don't have time for a long answer, but Kathy asked about Lean and Six Sigma within a law firm. Um, we had, you know, if you go back to the webinar library, um, two attorneys, friends of mine from Montreal, did a webinar in our Kinexa series, David Skinner and Karen Skinner, um, about uh, Lean for law firms. I, I would really also point to them as a resource to kind of explore that um, more deeply, how to get attorneys and staff more engaged in lean. Uh, and I'll, I'll put that in, um, in the chat, Kathy, maybe you can go find that. So uh, we're at the top of the hour. Um, Greg, I guess I'll, I'll let you wrap things up and, and have the last word here. I wanna thank everyone for attending, of course. I, I cannot believe that an hour flew by. I mean, literally I was almost thought you were, you were joking. I'll, I'll leave with the same sentiment that I almost always do. There, there is no better day than today than to either continue doing continuous improvement or to start doing continuous improvement. And continuous improvement is really, really important work. And so, so never forget about that. Well, thanks um, for that thought as always, Greg. And I'm going to final thing, put a chat put a link to that webinar that the Skinners did a few years ago. And it's not just about lean, but it also has application to professional services firms. So, all right, so we're, we're done. I, I know I said last word and now I'm, I'm babbling. So maybe that's a Kaizen opportunity, but we did some experiments today. We'd love to hear your feedback um, in the survey that you'll be prompted to uh, fill up about today's webinar. So yeah, maybe we'll figure out how to get more interactive elements um, along the way in future webinars. These are some good technologies. I think we can keep experimenting. Thanks, Mark. Thanks everyone Thank for joining Thanks us. Thanks everyone for attending. And um, again, I guess we'll see you kind next time in December.